Today on Heavy Meta, we're scaling the metal mountains with Insomnium's Winter's Gate. Where to begin with a piece absolutely so massive in scope and scale? Uh, Insomnium's new CD had an incredible amount of hype behind it. It had all kinds of samplers leading up to it, and there was just so much going into it. An entire book, uh, an entire lead up with tons of different materials. Uh, the label did an absolutely massive job of trying to really get in there and make sure people were hyped for this kind of thing. Um, Eric, did you have anything to add in with that? Well, I have to say that I was definitely hyped for it. Insomnia was probably my favorite band of all time, and that said, I was a little bit skeptical about how they could pull off a single 40-minute song. Yeah. They've always been able to do the slow songs that are maybe eight, nine, ten minutes, like in the Halls of Awaiting and stuff like that off of the first album. But I was a little bit skeptical that they could string together something for 40 minutes and make it coherent, especially considering that I didn't like the last album very much. Yeah, the, the last album was all atmospherics and absolutely no riffage. They'd been going that way for a really long time. Uh, one for Sorrow was the one that kind of tipped their hat in that aspect. Um, they moved away from that really riff-oriented approach where the songwriting was absolutely on the nose and started working towards... <laughs> this really maximalist approach to the keyboards. And while that's not a bad thing, there are a lot of really good atmospheric melodic death metal bands. I mean, look at Bellcore. They oh, do yeah. a great job of yeah. it. But the thing is that Insomnium's biggest point was the riffage here. Those tremolo riffs are the meat and potatoes of their songwriting. And when they started going away from it, I mean, Lord knows, bands need to experiment. But it needs to be experimentation that works out positively towards the entire sound. And that wasn't the case with their last several CDs. There were some good moments here and there, like Black Heart Rebellion and, um, what else? Revelations on the last album was yep. classic Insomnia. Oh, yeah. But other than that, across the last two albums, I'd say there were maybe four or five good songs. Yeah. Whereas Above the Weeping World, the entire album, start to finish, is a classic. And, uh... Uh, since the day it all came down, too. And those two, I think, are basically perfect as far as melodic death metal goes. Oh, yeah. In that specific style, we're talking the moody, melancholy, atmospheric-ish style. But back then, they also, like you were saying, focused more on riffs. So with this new 40-minute song, I was interested to see which direction they would, they would head in. When they have a 40-minute atmospheric song, which sounds like it could be potentially incredibly boring. Oh, yeah. Or would they blend in some older elements and... With the newer elements from the last album, which, like I said, I wasn't a big fan of, and how would it turn out? Yeah, and that's the big thing, is that nobody really knew. Now, it had some interesting lead-ins. Uh, in particular, Dan Swano was picking up the production for this, and that was a little bit hilarious, considering that the entire point was to make something really Edge of Sanity-esque. They even said very yep. specifically that they wanted to create a progressive death metal opus here, and really recruiting Dan Swano to do that production job, it really sealed the deal for a lot of people. Now, if anybody's not aware, Dan Swano is pretty much the definitive forefather of the progressive death metal sound. He absolutely cemented himself in a lot of people's minds with all of his earlier works, Crimson, Edge of Sanity, oh, yeah. in general. Edge of Sanity in general, even all of his solo works. Everybody knows about his works within the metal scene. So when this came to the forefront, when everybody found out about this, people started getting excited. Um, and so where does that leave us now? Well, the big thing here is, at least on Heavy Meta, 
we like to do all the bad and terrible stuff first. So we're just going to go straight for the gullet with all the garbage, and we're going to get that out of the way right now. And we're going to get back to the pros, because that's what you want to end off with. You want some cake right after you take a poop. The shit sandwich. You want to dine on that first and finish it off and go, that wasn't so bad, right? Absolutely. Exactly. So that's what we're going to get down to. So first and foremost, what are the least positive qualities of this CD? Well, I'd say the worst part of it for me is that it doesn't flow as cohesively as it could, which I was worried about. Right. But each individual movement, shall we say, when the song transitions into a different section, they could go stylistically across several genres. And they do each of these genres well, but the transitions between them is a little bit bumpy yeah. at times. Yeah, they, they can be particularly crude at points. And I think the biggest, uh, the biggest slip up here, and the biggest way that you can tell some of these transition pieces, or just transition pieces, was that when they were released digitally, when the album was released digitally, you could actually see that the tracks were individual tracks. <coughs> A lot of people said that was to make it easier for streaming services and pieces like that to be kind of distributed, but I, I think maybe it might have been something more than that, that these were individual tracks that were kind of strung along with interlude tracks. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm not. I just get that impression from the songwriting. It's not bad, and these transition pieces can be actually fairly good. I like a lot of those pieces, but they're not subtle in any particular shape. They're actually a little too Some on the nose. Some of them are a little bit jarring, yeah. to say the least. Yeah, they can be really jarring. Um, other than that, um, there's not a whole lot to really nitpick about. The only thing that I really have an issue with, I know that Eric doesn't really have an issue with it, I feel like the vocals are a little bit over-compressed. Um, they just seem like they're very processed. And that's a big issue considering that there is a massive story that's rolling along throughout the process of the CD. I feel like if these were maybe a little bit more cleanly produced, some, somehow a little slicker, I, I would have more of an interest in the story and seeing where it goes. And the clean vocals are phenomenally produced, actually. Yeah, excellently. And okay. they're excellently done. I think they're done much better than on the last couple albums, <clears throat> particularly Across the Dark when they debuted. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I've heard, seen a lot of people complaining about them. Oh, no, Insomnium, you know, as soon as they appeared on Across the Dark, Insomnium was headed down a commercial path. Right. And I think they've proven that with a 40-minute single song that they're not headed down a commercial path. They're still doing their own artistic vision. And that's a great, moody, atmospheric, memorable music that makes you feel something, I guess you could say. Right. That's always been what they've gone for. Absolutely. So, I think the biggest thing that we can take away from this is that even though it can be a little inconsistent in parts, it also has a lot of quality moments, too. Uh, the songwriting in general is absolutely increased from the last CD. Now, the songwriting here, it, it just feels meatier, it feels punchier, it feels more dynamic, it feels like it's finally found that happy medium between atmospherics and riffage. When they went full-on atmospheric mellow death on the last couple of CDs, you could really tell that they were trying extremely hard on that. Yeah, you had the sweet melodies, the really melancholic melodies that carried the mood perfectly, but then again, you look back to since today it all came down, and there were legitimately good riffs in there, like Black Water is the opening riff to that, is incredibly catchy, since it all, day it all came down, like I find myself humming those riffs all the time. And there wasn't much of that on the last album or two, it was just standard mellow death riffs with slow, sweet melodies. And I feel like on this album, Maybe the guitar players got more creative freedom mm -hmm. to be able to write what they wanted because there are definite discernible riffs all over the album. Like It's very consistently peppered with good riffs. Oh yeah, absolutely. The songwriting here is, is absolutely the best it's been in some time and it really does take those really, really sweeping riffs from their past, those tremolo riffs, and really integrate them better with the atmospheric keyboards. Oh, yeah. So really, I mean, they're not getting rid of those elements that they've been experimenting with for, you know, these last couple CDs. They're just finding a better balance between those moments and those past couple of CDs, those, those really, really well-regarded CDs. And I think that is the best part about it, is a lot of these Insomnium fans who are really getting aggravated that they were just kind of mellowing themselves out well, I mean, look no further than the new CD, because this one here has a lot of punchy, really hammered-on riffs that, that just feel like that really deep and warm, uh, nostalgic kind of uh, riffage, that really, that tone 
from their older CDs. People are going to be impressed with this CD just judging off of everything that they've heard from the samples. Yeah, I agree with that completely. I mean, it's they fixed, they've cleaned up all the issues from the last couple, and I know you touched on the production not being up to par for you earlier, but I think comparatively with the last couple albums, it's much less sterile. Maybe the vocals are similar, but the guitar has more punch, and everything is a little more audible. Like, I think on One for Sorrow, they started really taking the, they lost the dynamic range. Yeah. That especially Above the Weeping World had, and that hurt. But I think this moves it more in the right direction, but it's still not up to that production quality. So the the production's good, but it could have been a little better. Yeah, it could have been a little better, and especially considering that Dan Swano did a lot of the production work, I'm not saying it's bad. And I think that he actually probably did a very good job. You just kind of wonder uh, what the band's involvement with the production was, because at the end of the day, it really comes down to what the band wants and what the band is happy with. So... Hey, finding that happy medium between the two parties is, is really essential when music, you know, working on music. Um, so let's see here. We got all the shit, we got all the garbage, and we got to, of course, all the you know potent songwriting. We got all the melodies out of the way and everything solid that was going on with the CD. Eric, um, can you think of anything else that we need to talk about with this album? Well, I mean, there, like we said, there are some problems. I mean. The bass isn't that audible, other than other than the the really slow prog rock type. Maybe we, we should talk about the genres they do really quickly. They go across like a prog rock interlude towards oh, yeah. the middle. There's straight death doom section where uh, Nilo Savan and hopefully I pronounce his name correctly does a really deep guttural growl more mm -hmm. so than his regular one. And um, what else they do? Well, they definitely uh, hit some Floydian notes with this really progressive interlude. I know he already touched upon it a little bit. Yeah. Uh, what else? They, they get into some black metal riffage, actually, towards yeah, the end. particularly where they, the end, the outro. Oh, yeah. They, they really get that really dark and desolate atmosphere worked up uh, just with these really raw and gritty uh, renditions of the original riff. Because that riff, towards the beginning of the album, actually pops up multiple times, and it's interesting to see how the genres actually play into how the riff changes. It actually alternates depending on uh, what's being played or what's going on in the story. That's actually pretty cool. Oh, one more thing. Also, it's based on a short story that Nila Savanen, the main songwriter, principal songwriter and lyricist, wrote called Winter's Gate. And uh, I haven't gotten a chance to read that. I've tried to look for it online. I don't own the album yet, but I really would like to read that to get a better scope of what's going on. Because where the, the song seems to cover a lot of bases. It seems like there's some gaps missing. I'm not entirely sure what's going on. It seems like they're going between several characters. I know the basis of it. It it goes how you would expect an insomnia album to go lyrically. Right. It's not a happy ending. But uh, it's it's very well written, that all said. But I just feel like the transition from short story to song lyrics is a tough one. And isn't necessarily perfect. But the lyrics themselves are excellently written. There's a lot of metaphors involving winter and nature and, you know, all the things you'd love from Insomnium and come to expect. Oh, yeah. It checks all the boxes. Oh, yeah, definitely. It would, of course, there are a bunch of surprises, like we said, but it does hit all the notes you want to hear. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, that said, yeah, I give it an 8 out of 10. In that regard, when with that all said and done, I think I want to give the CD, uh, I want to give it a 9. Yep. So I think we can pretty much combine these scores together and by our powers combined an 8.5 is uh, is in play here. So yeah, let's leave it on that. Uh, I'm David. I'm Eric. And this has been Heavy Meta. You have just watched this entire thing. <laughs> you poor, poor bastards.